everybody. Welcome to the Flying Go Farm podcast with me, Lisa Check. Today is episode number eight, fast fashion versus slow fashion. Um, what's happening on the farm today? So it is a, it's been a weird week. It's been um, hot and we're supposed to get and muggy and we're supposed to get a nice um, cool breeze coming through. So the weekend should be really, really nice. And so we're looking forward to that. We've been harvesting some things around here, our white peaches, and we, we froze those for throughout the year. We harvested our pears, um, those you harvest and then you have to wait. So this weekend we have to check and see if they are, have ripened yet. Um, they're still like rock hard when you get them off the fence, off the tree and you have to wait for them to, to soften up and change those carbohydrates into sugars. So we'll be doing that. I think we're going to try to go up to the orchard, to the Catoctin orchard and get honey crisp apples because those are my favorite. Um, we do have apple trees here. We have a few apples. But we don't, usually what I do with those is I make um, applesauce, so not really eating apples. Some of them are like more like cider apples, so they're better to be cooked. Um, so that is what's happening on the farm this weekend. So today I wanted to talk about style, and it might be kind of weird for me to be talking about style, kind of think so. But I have thought about how my style has changed through the years from, you know, my early 20s going to discos and, um, you know, my work life and then being more of an artist and living on the West Coast and having um, an artist pers persona that I reflected in my clothing. And then now as a farmer and when I was teaching, I kind of went into like very... Um, you know, e things easy to wear, t-shirts, jeans, you know, khakis for work and shirts and vests, you know, down vests because it's always so cold in schools and stuff. And I really didn't feel like that ref reflected me, my soul inside, but it was um, something that was easy to, to wear. And so I just kind of did it because it was easy but really our clothes define us so they tell us what our they tell other people you know what our culture is what our socioeconomic status is um, often it tells people where we live um, or um, it tells people what we do for a living I don't know how many times I've seen people in the grocery store in Walmart in the malls things like that with um, scrubs on so I think oh they must be a nurse or work in a hospital somewhere, or maybe work for a vet or something like that. Um, so you, you can tell, or you see the guys that have like a shirt with their name on it, and, you know, so, you know, I don't know that that would be necessarily their style, but it's what they need to, they, they uh, by the clothes that they're wearing, they're telling us what they do for a living. But right now, this time in history, the lines are kind of being blurred about that. And that's because the fast fashion is, and this fast, fast fashion culture is hurting us as much as fast food has been hurting us throughout the years. And that's what I really wanted to talk to you today about is just to put a little, um, put a little thought into your head about the next time that you go um, clothes shopping, um, things that I didn't really um, understand, even though I've been uh, in the fiber world for over 30 years, I just didn't think of clo clothes in this way that I'm learning about now. A lot of this information that I've gotten is from a book by Rebecca Burgess called Fiber Shed. Um, and in this, this mini series inside of my first um, season, I'm going to be talking about this fast, fast, fast fashion and also about fiber sheds and, um, and giving you some ideas about how you can um, make your wardrobe more sustainable, giving you idea of showing you how, what I'm doing to make my wardrobe more sustainable and more mindful, I guess, um, is what it would be. 
So fast fashion, it used to be like probably in my mother's day, um, probably in the 60s at least, that there used to be just two seasons of fashion. There was like your your fall winter season and your spring summer season, and you had two sets of clothing basically that you would put away, you probably still have parents or grandparents that do this, where you just, you take out your summer clothes um, maybe around um, Memorial Day, and then you put them away, maybe around Labor Day, maybe a little bit later now that the, it is getting much warmer these days. Um, but there were these two seasons of fashion, and people would look to the designers and look to you know major um, clothing manufacturers to see what is going to be in style this season. Well, now it's, you know, the internet and influencers and marketers and, you know, 24 seven shopping that you can do at willy nilly whenever you want. We now basically have 52 mini seasons and that's about one a week, right? We have 52 weeks. Um, and these fast fashion trends are designed to be bought delivered, worn, and, and then discarded within a matter of days or weeks. Like they're meant to be worn for, you know, one, one or two times and then um, disposed of or given away or something so that you can get the next seasons or the next week's trend. And um, that can be, that's, it's really has changed our world and it's something to be thinking about. In 2018, there were 80 million garments sold around the world. That's a lot. That's a lot of garments. And in the United States, there's an average of 67 garments bought per person per year. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't buy 67 garments. So there's somebody else out there that's buying way more than 67 garments a year to make up for the stuff that I am not buying. Um, and you may be in that in that uh, situation as well. Or maybe you have family members who are the, on the other side. Maybe you say, no, 67 garments, no way. That kid is buying 200 um, gar you know, shoes and garments and purses and accessories and you know, um, jewelry and things like that in a year. Um, and so, so you have may maybe have one of those in your family as well. And it's it takes, you should note that the textile industry employs 300 million people around the world. And most of those 300 million people are not in our country. Um, we do have, you know, you have the brands, you have the marketers, you have the influencers, you have, um, you know, the, the big corporate people, they're probably in the US or in Europe, but then you have millions and millions of people who are doing the, um, the work to get the fiber into yarn and then yarn into fabric and then fabric needs to be dyed and then fat, that dyed fabric has to be cut and then sewn and then labeled and then uh, priced, you know, with the little, um, the, what do you call that thing? The little plastic thing where they put the price tag on. It's just that there is a lot, there are a lot of people that are touching um, and working in this industry. So these clothes, they're, they're cheaply made in the worst working conditions in the world. And I think that we all know that. Um, I don't think that that is a, um, I don't think that's new news. And that's how it can be so inexpensive to buy them. I know that, you know, you can go into Walmart and get a t-shirt for like $3, $5. You know, look at the old Navy ads um, that are on TV. It's like, you can get a pair of jeans for like $15 or $20. It's like, how could they be so cheap? You know, it's because they're paying these people, you know, subsistence wages, basically. Um, and uh, so many of our clothes are made of synthetic fibers. If they aren't totally polyester or synthetic fibers, then they are a blend that includes synthetic fibers. And where do those come from? So again, that's something that I really didn't think of. They come from crude oil. 
the industry uses about 350 barrels of oil a year. 300, that's not right. 350 million barrels of oil a year. And they produce 282 billion kilograms of CO2. Um, that's from you know all of the factories um, that are working to you know make these the oil now into something that looks like a fiber that can be spun into yarn and etc 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 all the way down the line until it lands in your box from um, the internet. So the fabrics and the dyes and ultimately clothes are made mostly made in unregulated factories in third world countries. There are no unions. Um, we've we've heard of you know horrible situations with you know, I think mostly like India, Bangladesh, where like the whole building has collapsed because that the, the the building was uh, put up so shoddily that um, they. It, it kills, you know, hundreds or thousands of people when the whole thing collapses. Um, and then creating those textiles and dyeing them also uses 25 trillion gallons of water each year. That's a lot of water, too. So the wastewater, you know, any of the wastewater that's going through those plants when they're making the fiber, when they're... Um, when they're dying and all that, it all gets, the wastewater all gets sent back into the streams and rivers that are close to those factories. And so this accounts for 20% of all of the fresh, all of the world's fresh water pollution, which would be your streams and rivers. But ultimately, it's all going into the oceans. That's sort of alarming. And these are things that I really hadn't thought about and I bet that you haven't thought about them either. So, yeah, why should why should I care about that? Maybe I want that five dollar t shirt or those fifteen dollar jeans um, from from Old Navy. Well, I think you should. You know, I think we have seen in this past few years that we really do need to think about um, our planet. We need to be thinking about climate crisis. We need to th be thinking about pollution and. You know, what we're doing with our trash and what we're doing with our body and what we're doing about the bodies of those you love. Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, being a teacher for so many years, I just saw a huge increase in the number of kids, number one, that are coming to school with more allergies than ever. Adults who are getting allergies. I never had allergies before. Why am I getting allergies now? You're seeing kids with more um, behavioral issues. You're seeing um, young adults with more mental health issues. Now, I'm not, I don't know if that's coming from um, the clothes that we wear, but I'm pretty sure that some of that is coming from the toxins that are in our environment. Um, people never used to have problems with gluten with eating bread or pasta. And now it just seems like everybody has a gluten sensitivity. Everybody wants gluten-free bread and gluten-free pasta. And people are trying to av avoid milk. It's like, we never had that when we were growing up. And it, feel, it seems to me that things that we are doing, not just clothing, but things that we're doing in farming and in um, processing food and clothing and probably building materials and all kinds of things, all of those things are coming together to make um, a world that's a lot less hospitable than it used to be, a lot less healthy than it used to be. And so I think if there's something that we can do, then we should do it. So what is wrong with that for the planet, right? So our fast fashion diet is affecting the planet um, I already talked about the 282 billion kilos of CO2. And so the projections are that by 2050, the textile industry will use up 20%, 26% of that global um, carbon budget that was agreed to and the Paris agreements in order to keep um, the, the rising 
um, heat of our planet down to two degrees Celsius, 26%. So that, you know, that doesn't, and that's just one industry. It doesn't count any of the other industries. It doesn't count for people on the world because we breathe out carbon dioxide, right? So we are also being emitters, right? Um, and just for this one industry, it's taking a quarter of that carbon budget. And trash, come on, trash is piling up here. Um, we throw out an average of 80 pounds of clothing per year. A lot of us feel good because we're like giving it to Goodwill. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the things that are sent to Goodwill, they aren't usable by Goodwill. So it goes and it's sold to other countries or sent to other countries. Some of them, uh, some of the clothes that are sent can be like unraveled, um, especially like sweater, I guess like sweaters and things like that could be unraveled and then reworked into some other piece of clothing. But otherwise it ends up in their trash heaps. Um, in the United States, this 80 pounds of clothing per year is representing 5% of all of the munic municipal trash. Um, and because it's mostly synthetic, it isn't biodegradable. Um, they say about 15% of the clothes that we buy are recycled or resold. Um, I think I try, I try to, to recycle or donate things that are still in good condition. Um, but again, like I said, a lot of those in, ends up in the trash in another country. And the value of those discarded clothes, 460 billion dollars a year. The money that we have spent, we've worn it once or twice, and then it's trash. Again, food for thought. Water pollution, we talked a little bit about the water pollution, um, all the wastewater that's going out from the textile um, factories and also the dye houses. But also let's talk about um, some of the fibers that they use. So rayon, tencel, bamboo, these are things that we have considered to be kind of more um, earth friendly, eco friendly, especially bamboo, like they have touted that all over the place as like a new sustainable fiber source. It is so toxic to make though. Basically what they're doing, rayon, rayon is taking um, trees basically, um, Tencel is taking bamboo and mostly they just call it bamboo and for the lay person. Um, they take the, they cut and make the, the wood into um, pulp and then they use um, toxic solvents to break it down into a liquid form. And then they can put it through these big machines that are kind of like, um, I would say they're kind of like spaghetti machines, only, you know, the spaghetti that they're making is really, 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 really tiny. It's not like what we would consider spaghetti, right? But it's that kind of process where they're shooting out this liquid and it's, um, it's coagulating, which is not the right word, but it's like, it's setting itself as it hits air. And um, that's how they make the, the fine threads. And, Rayon manufacturing was so toxic that in, in 2013, they banned the manufacturing of it from the U.S. But most of our clothes are made overseas, so it doesn't really affect us. And I was kind of surprised that it took till 2013 to ban the rayon manufacturing. That surprised me because I would think that that would have done, been done a while ago, but I guess not. And we already talked about all the synthetics, so many names that you can't know. I mean, we know polyester, um, but there's all kinds of different um, synthetic uh, fibers and, and names of which that they're using. And it just uses a lot of oil per year, a lot of water. And then this other thing, this next thing, water pollution, when we are washing our own clothes, that as we as there's natural abrasion or when our clothes are in the washing machine, those microfibers that are in these synthetics 
um, are actually uh, being shed, they come off. Um, and they, these microfibers are ending up in, you know, freshwater ponds, lakes, streams, whatever is downstream from your water treatment plant. In my case, it's probably ending up in my, um, my septic tank and piling up there. And I don't know, they could be small enough that then they're going down into the earth too. That part I'm not sure about, but they're just everywhere. So once they're in those ponds and lakes and streams, they're gonna be into, this, into the ocean. And they're now in our food supply because this, the, the fish are eating those microfibers. And they did a study and they found that Europeans were eating about 11,000 pieces of this microfiber each year by eating shellfish. They apparently eat more shellfish than we do in the United States. Um, I hope this doesn't mean that you will stop eating shellfish. Um, they're one of my favorite things. But um, it is kind of alarming to think about, you mean pieces of my clothes are now in the fish that I, it could be in the fish that I eat or in the shellfish that I eat. That's what's wrong with this. And then for our society. So 98% of our clothing is made outside our borders. Only 2% is made inside of our borders. And like I said before, there's no regulation or very little regulation, poor working conditions, um, child labor, and even um, the adult labor, it's bordering on slave labor. Um, the women aren't allowed any kind of maternity leave. They're paid by the piece in many cases. So that if, in order for you to make enough money to feed your family, you have to do so many pieces and it doesn't matter how long it takes you to make those pieces you may be working 16 18 hours to make those enough pieces so that you can feed your family and that's just really heartbreaking and that's how we have five dollar t-shirts and the thing about the united states is we don't see that impact we don't see it at all it's in another country every now and again like when those two uh, factories collapsed so we see the the effects of that but did that make you stop buying clothes that were made in um, bangladesh do we even know where the clothes are being made there isn't a lot of transparency so yeah, again, we don't see the impact. It's in another country. We get to have our nice, new, crisp clothes. You know, they come in a nice box if we buy it online, or we go to a nice, clean store, and we never have to look at what our choices are doing to the rest of the world. What are our, I, because I want that piece, that my, my wanting that fashion is somehow connected to that woman in Bangladesh or to the man in Bangladesh that who's doing the dyeing or the company that is making um, the, the um, bamboo into Tencel or rayon. We don't, we don't think about it. I, I haven't thought about it. And, you know, I've been a weaver for a number of years. And so I've never really thought about what it, what the rest of that fashion was, um, what it took to make it. And then for your body, I mean, you're just bringing it home. Um, there are toxins in those dyes and the fiber finishes that can affect your body. I know that um, I just recently bought some capris and shorts for the summer. I hadn't bought any for a while. I had lost a little weight. And so I bought some shorts and capris and when I opened that box, oh my gosh, it smelled like, it smelled like mothballs. And I thought to myself, well, maybe that's because of this whole COVID thing. And maybe, maybe that's what it's from, but that smell has stayed even through washing. And so I'm thinking that it's something else that's, that is um, part of the process. And, you know, now I'm wearing though that smell, whatever's causing that smell is next to my skin. 
So, and there's significant evidence that chronic disease is caused by inf environmental toxins. We don't know if they're if it's caused by dyes because you know dyes and cloth things that are used in clothing are not researched. Um, we just don't have the um, we don't have the evidence of that, but we do know that some of these, especially dyes, are very closely related to other um, toxins that have been researched. So um, that's how I can say that you know we, we know that there are toxins in those clothes. Um, forest or barrel oil barrel to skin industry relies on some substances we know to be ca cancerous. Um, and they cause reproductive disorders, DNA damage, and endocrine disruption. That can be, um, you know, cause of those reproductive disorders, but it also can be um, endocrine disruption in your liver, in your pancreas, in your thyroid, um, in, the, in your hypothalamus, like growth disorders with kids. Um, so it's something to think about. And then for your children. So we specifically know that azo dyes um, are the cause that they cause problems in fetal development. And they also specifically cause behavior problems later in life. And they have found, they call these, um, azo is just one of these endocrine disruptors. There's, a, it's a whole class of chemicals. And they found these in the GMO cotton fields. They found them in dyes. They found them in, dex, in textile finishes and in fabric co coatings. So these things, they disrupt your, your, hormone, your hormone patterns, right? So they can change your metabolism. They can change your sleep and your mood. They change growth in kids. They change your reproductive health or your children's reproductive health. And they've been caused to increases in cancer like pancreatic cancer, prostate, breast, ovarian, and thyroid cancers. So you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it to have these brightly colored, stain-free, wrinkle-resistant, and water-resistant clothes? Is it worth it? It's hard. It's hard to think about what would I do instead. Okay, so what do we do instead? So right now, there isn't any transparency in the clothing market. You don't know where they're made. Um, you don't know what conditions that they're in or what dyes they've used or what finishes they've used. Um, but you can, you can start looking at a different strategy for yourself. That's all we can do because I, I don't really see the, the industry changing to make it more transparent. I mean, look at look at all the information that we have about food, about you know natural and unnatural processed food, and we still get can't get transparency there. So why do we think that even that the clothing industry would ever be close to being transparent? I just it, it'll be a long time if ever. So the change has to come from us. So right now, what can you do right now? The first thing is to wear your clothes longer. And in order to do that, we need to take care of our clothes better. Um, and this is not something, this is a number one on my shopping list for this week is to buy fragrance-free detergent. Um, I've always, I like Gain, I like how it smells. I like Tide, I like that how that smells too. It smells clean, right? Um, but I'm gonna start buying fragrance-free detergent. I have been washing in cold water for a while now, um, and this will help your clothes last longer. And it's gonna add you know, minimal or no chemicals back onto your body. And you know, go through your closet and look for those items that could be part of a capsule wardrobe. Have you ever heard of a capsule wardrobe? Basically, it's like, it's a small amount of items that make like the the foundation of your style. So, you know, depending on what your style is. So like uh, two skirts, two pants, uh, two or three shirts, a blazer, um, or, and you know, a belt, a few belts, something like that. You know, no more than like 30 pieces. You have a capsule wardrobe for summer, a, cam a ca capsule wardrobe for winter, 
and then you can add in like one or two things that would that will help you know make more choices that you have but you're not um, buying lots and lots and lots of clothes you have this capsule this um, foundation that you are working on um, in your in your wardrobe um, go and check out when well, we can go back to the thrift stores I think some of them are open now um, but to buy quality used clothing from thrift stores consignment services you'd be surprised what you can find there I have to say I'm not a thrift store person um, but I think I want to start looking for you know really some some quality pieces I know people that have found like beautiful cashmere sweaters um, and that kind of thing and so I I think well you know maybe I should be looking a little bit more there um, but there's lots of consignment services out, or, or consignment uh, stores out there as well um, then mend your clothing if you can and think boho chic chic boho chic there's lots of books there's like four or five books out right now and I will put them in the show notes on the podcast um, page on our website um, the visible mending, joyful mending, um, all these these mending books where basically you are um, adding design elements to the rips that you have or the faded parts that you have, adding embroidery thread and um, and special stitches and things like that to make them look cute. And also you could go to clothing swaps or host a clothing swap party with your friends especially if you have friends that are all kind of around in the same um, size especially um, like there's those tot swaps that you can go to um, for children's clothes they're, they're going to need more clothes because they're always growing right um, and so thinking about going to those um, tot swaps kind of thing to look for kid clothing that is you know quality and in good condition So in the future, when you are buying new clothes, focus on buying clothing from a fair trade business. What I'm wearing today is from um, Marketplace. It's just called Marketplace. But I know that this was made in India on the tag. I should have brought it in here. But on the tag, it's how, it has the name of the person who did the embroidery on here. Um, and it talks about how the things are made. Was it cheap? No, this was more than $5, but th these also last a really long time. They're made really well. Um, I've had, uh, I have three others that I want to say I bought five years ago and I put them through the washing machine and everything and um, they have really held up very, very well. Um, but there's lots of fair trade businesses out there. Just look at you know, just Google it. Again, I will put this marketplace um, in the show notes. They actually um, have a store that's near us in um, in the New Market area. No, New Windsor area. And a lot of times you can go there for um, sales. And um, so that's kind of fun. Um, also, you know, buy or from organic clothing companies if you can, especially for your kids, especially for little kids. Um, try to get a hello. Try to get um, organic clothing. I just said hello. You, the people that are listening on the podcast, you heard that little ding ding ding. And so what happened was my uh, the, the screen changed. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see all of my files on my hard drive. Um, anyway, back to what we're talking about. Um, and when you buy, buy classic fashion. fashion. Glass, buy things that are going to last for a long time. Try to buy things that are 100% natural f fabrics. Um, you know, buying a wool coat instead of a synthetic coat. Um, buying um, a really nice, you know, cotton or linen shirt that will last that's a hundred percent natural fabrics and once you wear it wear it wear it you can reuse these things too but again if they're a hundred percent natural you can put them in your compost pile and then you're adding nitrogen and carbon actually 
carbon back into um, the soil. So um, once you've used them, you know, thinking back to, you know, the 1800s, you know, people didn't have, they didn't have as many clothes as we have. They also, you know, when the, when the clothes got too threadbare to wear, then they used them for rags or they used them to, to line um, their other coats or they used them to make um, quilts. They were constantly reusing this fabric because they valued the fabric. They knew how much time and energy it had taken to spin that yarn and to weave that fabric because their family had done it, right? Or they, or people in their community had done it. So um, they used it until it totally fell apart. And there are some corporate brands now that are that are that will repair or resell their used products. So. Um, North Face, Patagonia, um, L.L. Bean, and Eileen Fisher. I saw a story one time on the news not that long ago about L.L. Bean and um, how they, you could send back your coats and they would be like re-water uh, resistanted and that this one person had sent it back like every year for the past like 20 years or something and they kept getting the getting it back and getting it like repaired and so they could use it for a long long time so think about buying from corporate brands that do something like that eileen fisher um I, apparently in their stores they have um a place where you can um give back your used items and they will either um, resell them or um or then take them back down to thread or something like that. And then there are next steps. So um, there are a couple of challenges out there. There is a challenge called the 100 day dress. Um, I'm not suggesting anybody totally does this, but it's based on a teacher who wore the same dress for 100 days, I think in a row. Um, but, you know, getting a lot of wear out of your clothes, that's the whole point. And there's another one that challenges you not to buy any new clothes for a year and see how it goes, see what you find out. Also find out about the, a fiber shed in your area. So a fiber shed is a place where you can find out about yarn producers, fabric weavers, and local clothing producers that are in your area and that are working to make clothing sustainable and healthy um, for the environment and for yourself. Um, this is a fiber shed has been a huge project for me um, for this year and um, it's been slow to get to be to get to make connections with the, there, there are two or three fiber sheds in this Maryland area and um, that they have already been set up but they're kind of like not really uh, working at this point and so um, I'm hoping to get more involved with one of the, of the three of them to be able to um, make it a more vibrant place where local people can find um, hand, hand woven fabric, hand spun yarn, or like what I produce farm yarn from my own fleeces. And so in the next few um, episodes in this little mini series that I'm doing. I'm going to be talking more about the whole fiber shed movement, um, more about what it means for a producer like me and for someone who is a knitter, crocheter, um, weaver like you. So I want to thank you for joining me today. If you have any questions about um, this podcast, please be sure to um, send me an email. Um, I'd love answering questions. I want to have a QA and a uh, podcast in the future, and I'm looking for people that have questions to ask me. So no question is too silly. Um, just forward something to me. And so um, that could be one of our next podcasts. So thank you again. Thank you very much for listening today. Happy making.